chapter 3 and verse 7. Scripture starts off, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him a new, my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Today we're, we're looking at the church at, hey, Natalia, popped in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, everybody's coming in. All right, this is great. Um, we're, we're looking at the church at Philadelphia. And the big thing that, um, so I'm, I'm kind of like you guys. I like, I like uh, there's a few YouTube channels that I like, some, some good history channels I, I, I really like. Um, and there's one that I really like. They, they teach great history, but they, they talk about the Bible sometimes, and I think they miss the point. All right, this is why I'm saying this. It is very popular, and I'm not even arguing against it, okay? There's, very, there's a very popular idea that the seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 are seven church ages. How many of you ever heard that? Okay, okay, yeah. Now, I mean, that's, that's an interpretation. There's nothing in the Bible that really says that, but that's an interpretation, okay? But what we can't do is this. We can't take this extrapolated idea and forget what it actually says, amen? There's a problem, all right? Now listen, I'm not, again, I, I, I'm not against it. Somebody thinks, no, actually, Pastor, I think this is seven church ages. That's great. But we know its primary source, the primary thing, is that it's actual, literal seven churches. And um, we, this, is, this is kind of a problem today in a lot of, Bible studies that people have at homes, and I'm not against anybody studying the Bible, okay? But I just want you to know that as a pastor, my teeth itch sometimes when somebody says, oh, uh, me and a bunch of people, we just came over, and we just had a great Bible study, and I'm thinking, oh, good. I wonder, not that you guys aren't sound or anything like that, but I just want you to know as a pastor, I do get concerned because historically, as a pastor, I've had to do a lot of fixing. Okay, <laughs> and, 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 and here's the biggest problem with any Bible study, okay? By the way, if you're a believer, you're a priest, amen? You have, just as I have, the ability to study God's Word and know God's Word, amen? We are priesthood of believers, amen? One of, so I'm not against people studying the Bible or even want to study in a group. I'm not against that. But one of the deadly things that happen in home Bible studies, and sometimes it happens in churches too, is instead of looking at what the Scripture says, they go, well, what does this mean to you? You know, well, I, I think this just means that, I don't know, life is like a fluffy cloud. Oh, that's good. What does this mean to you? And it's like everybody's opinion is so relative 
and we have forgotten exactly what the Word of God says. Now, if we're given opinions, opinions are like noses, right? Everybody has one and it smells, right? We need to get back to what does the Word of God teach and, and maybe a little bit of background on it too. Let's, let's talk about this church of Philadelphia. Now, is anybody like a super scholar and you, can, you already know what the name Philadelphia means? Anybody know? Yeah. Food? No, absolutely not. And you might think Philadelphia cheese. Is that what you're thinking? No, it's... it's Okay, but see, I, I knew what he was saying. By the way, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you something right now, okay? If you ever go to America, if your dad ever loves you enough to take you to America, okay, okay, if he does, if he does, go to Philadelphia and get a Philadelphia cheesesteak. Right, right, Philadelphia cheesesteak. I ain't going to describe it anymore. Or if your flight goes through Philadelphia, there's a Tony Luke's, okay? It'll change your life. All right? Tony Luke, you just, whatever, you know, just, and no. No. All right. So what do you, city of brotherly love, okay? Phila, which is brotherly love, Delphia city, city of brotherly love. So um, actually, Philadelphia, the, the state, the colony in America was started by Quakers. I think we know that right? We all know that, right? And, uh, but that, the name wasn't original with them. This was actually the place that it was named. It was founded by the king of Pergamus. Remember Pergamus? One of the, one of the, uh, one of the um, churches already mentioned in here, Pergamus. It was actually founded by the king of Pergamus in the second century BC for his brother. Now, um, Eumenides, the second, Rome kind of wanted Eumenides to start a rebellion against his brother. And they said, you do this, we'll get your brother out of the way, and we'll set you up. And he refused, and he refused uh, to do anything against his brother. And his brother was so grateful that he, he started the city, and he named it in behalf of his brother, the city of brotherly love. Thank you for not overthrowing me. Let me give you a city based upon your brotherly love. If you go there today, uh, there's not a whole lot left of the old city of Philadelphia. There's some ruins of a little bit of a church, um, of a huge basilica, and you can kind of get the idea of how big those pillars are. But really, there's not a whole lot left of it. Um, this actual church was probably, if we're following history right, was probably a church plant out of Philadelphia. They, um, the, the city of Philadelphia was kind of on a trade route, so um, it, was, it was an up and growing place. And by the way, just to give you an idea, many church planters, instead of uh, planting churches in big places, they look at up and coming places. So they could be on the ground floor and, and, uh, and be in a nice location in the beginning instead of, you know, on a dirt path 30 miles away from where the actual place is. Um, do you remember what I, I've said repeatedly? If you're going to understand the book of the Revelation, you need to understand something really well. Anybody remember what that is? Yeah. Old Testament. Very good, Toby. Well done. The Old Testament. You need to understand the Old Testament, and especially to this church. There's going to be so many overtones and undertones about Jewish life, Jewish tradition. Now, who were the first believers? Who were the first Christian believers? Okay. Jews. Jews. Okay. Now, again, historically speaking, when, when, the, when the Jews were getting saved, Okay, did they say that they were a, a separate religion? No, they said, we're just a fulfillment. This is everything that the Old Testament promised. This is, this is everything there. They, weren't, they, were, they were never trying to separate themselves. They said, this is the natural progression of who we are as Jews, as believers. Their Messiah was Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. Um, all, all that was Jewish. They weren't trying to deny their Jewish heritage. But they did say that uh, 
Jesus Christ fulfilled many of the Old Testament uh, things and that the gospel needs to not only go to uh, the Jews first, but also to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. And they need to make sure that the Gentiles didn't come under, um, didn't, knew that they didn't have to come under the same laws as Israel. And there was a lot of issues back then. But as Christianity grew, you had Jews that did believe the gospel, and you had more Jews that didn't believe the gospel. And so now there's an issue. And the issue comes when we bring Rome into it. Because Rome, uh, Rome had to make a deal with Israel. Okay? Rome, everywhere where Rome was, it says that if you're going to be a good citizen in good standing, you need to worship Rome as a god and maybe the emperor as a god as well. Okay? And how do you think the Jews felt about that? They said, they said we'll die. No problem. We will all die before we do that. And the Romans very quickly knew that if they were going to enforce this, that they were going to lose a lot of tax revenue. Okay? Honestly. Remember, the love of money, root of all evil. But because they didn't want to lose all this tax revenue, and Israel is a very important connection between Africa, Asia, and Europe. It all meets right there. They actually gave the Jews a special dispensation. They said, okay, you guys don't have to do that. Now, it was only the Jews. So, as these Christians are growing in their faith, Jewish believers are growing in their faith, they begin to be asked questions like, why don't you sacrifice in the temple? Well, we don't need to. And then very quickly, why don't you keep all the dietary laws? Well, we don't have to. Well, what are you? Aren't you Jews? Well, we're, we're Christians. And very quickly, the idea of Christian and Jew began to separate. Okay? Now, once Rome no longer hears that you're a Jew, you're no longer under that special dispensation, right? Now, um, now you need to offer incense, you need to worship this God or else. And this is where so much of the persecution arose from. Do we kind of get this background? Okay. When Christians started talking about that they were in the new, uh, that, they, that they saw the Messiah, that they, uh, about the resurrection, they would go to different synagogues. Paul writes about this, doesn't he? Where did Paul go when he first went to a new place? He went to the synagogues. He would put on his old pharisaical robes. He would come in and he would say, I'm a Benjamin. I was trained by Gamaliel. I did this, I did this, I did this. Ooh, yeah, please come in and teach us. And he taught them and he taught them about Jesus Christ, taught them about the gospel, and many people believed. Until there's a certain point where they went, ooh, we don't like you anymore, get out. And then his ministry went to the Gentiles. Right? We're, we're picking up on that. Early Christians, early Jewish Christians were welcomed into the synagogue. Synagogues back then had a very open door. If you were a Jew, come on in. This is one more thing I want you to get in your mind about synagogues. Am I going too fast for anybody? This is a lot of information, I know that but I'm, I'm just trying to get you to understand everything. Synagogues were not like churches. Not at all. Synagogues were more like meeting places where the Jews would actually kind of police themselves, where they would say where different needs are, and then there would also be the reading of the scriptures, and they would talk about those. But it was more than just the reading of the scriptures. It was a whole community event. Even though they were under Roman law, they really kept by their rules. They didn't, they didn't um, necessarily oppose Roman law, fight against it, almost like the Amish. 
heard of the Amish before? Or Amish? Okay, you've heard of the Amish? Hey, the Amish, you know, they're, they're like just a little blip on the screen. And we, you know, people, yeah, they're Amish. They don't go by the rules as everybody else. Um, they still have to pay taxes just like everybody else. But their meetings, um, they're not in the same governmental meetings as everybody else. They, they just think differently. The Jews would think the same way. Now, once somebody was in the synagogue and they kept on talking about that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah, those that rejected it would reject not just what they were saying, but reject those individuals. If you were a Jew, everything about the synagogue was your identity. You could kind of make it a little bit of akin to, um, and Taz, I believe you and I were talking about this a while ago. Have you ever met somebody that was a Jehovah Witness? If you haven't, there is a reality that even if they no longer believe what's going on, in order to be a good person, Jehovah Witness, you have to stay in this little cocoon. You have to forsake family. You don't go to anybody's birthdays. You, I mean, and it is, there's a reason why it's called a cult. Okay? And when somebody, you, you talk to anybody who is an ex-Jehovah Witness, like, let me ask you a question. Let's say, uh, let's say Taz said, forget it, I'm no longer a Christian. And he left. What would our attitude towards him be? We love you. Let's talk. Let's do this. Okay? Ten years we see him. Are we going to go, don't talk to me? Is that going to be our attitude? No. As a matter of fact, Christianity is, if you want to leave, leave. But we love you. We want to welcome you back. We, we want to try to get these things. We want you to believe in Christ. This isn't a club. Right? Once you leave the Jehovah Witnesses, you are completely cut off. And the only friends you had were Jehovah Witnesses. Now you have no friends. The only family that you still have contact with are Jehovah Witnesses. Okay? So when you leave, you literally lose everything. These believers, when they trusted in Christ, once the synagogues finally rejected them, they lost everything. The community only knew them as Jews, and they were a little bit funny. The community... The regular Gentile community, they didn't want anything to do with them anyways. So they've lost those people. They've lost their, they've lost their national identity. They've lost everything. They were, remember, the, um, the synagogues had open-door policy for Jews, but now these were kicked out. As a matter of fact, even today in Jewish culture, if you leave Judaism, let's say to become a Christian, you'll hear this expression sometimes, he's dead to me. He's dead. And it's not just a figure of speech. There are times that they will even have funerals for the individual. No joke. They are dead. And so when, when these Jews practice their Christianity, it cost them everything. They're, and, and that's just with the Jews. For the Rome, uh, for the Romans, remember the Romans have this tax exempt roll. Now their names are, are struck off the roll. Now you're no longer tax exempt. It cost them everything. Okay, we get this, right? Let's go back to verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, and he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. First things he, Jesus says about himself is he says, I am holy. Leviticus. 
When there was any questions about the law, why did Jesus say the law was given? Why, why shouldn't you work on the Sabbath? What, what was his reasoning? Because he's holy. Why should you not mix fabrics? He's holy. I mean, throughout the book of Leviticus, and anybody's personal Bible reading plans ever die in the book of Leviticus? Okay, right? I'm going to tell you, next time, oh, we're, we're almost at January, right? When, when we all get bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and we go, this is the year. This is the year I'm going to go through my, my Bible thing. I, I think my, my wife has another uh, Bible reading plan. And look, I, I, I get it. I get when Bible reading plans happen is you're so good for those first few weeks and then you miss a day and you're still, oh, okay, I'll catch up. And then you miss a couple of days and then you don't catch up. And, and then you're like ashamed. And so you just ghost everybody and you die. Okay? We're all laughing because we've all been there. I'm, I'm going to help you not die in the book of Leviticus. Okay? Book of Leviticus, I want the, I'm one of those weird people. It's my favorite Old Testament book. Is, does that sound weird to anybody? Like, pick it, only you, right? Yeah, sure, buddy. You, that's true. Okay, I'm going to tell you why. Because it constantly is revealing God's holiness. Around every corner, we see how God is different. We see, I mean, just ever, he's holy, he's holy. And I get so excited about the, and, and every time I get that phrase, uh, be holy, because I'm holy. I'm like, oh, let me go back and read. Why is he telling Israel to be separate? Why is he telling Israel to be different? Why is he telling, isn't that what we teach our kids? And by the way, we struggle with this, don't we? Because this world has so many hooks in so many different ways. And kids, I'm just going to let you know, it's not that your parents don't want you to have any fun. They just know the wiles of the wicked one is so vast, he's going to creep in and he's going to get a hook and he's going to do things and they are desperately trying to raise you so that when they see the Lord, they can say, Lord, I, I did what I thought was best. Am I right, parents? It's scary to be a parent. It is. It's terrifying. Um, somebody, uh, somebody once said, you know, before you become a dad, you have to take a test. And somebody said, well, what happens if you fail it? You become a mom. No, it just... <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. All right. But anyways, let's, let, let's go back to the Bible, okay? <laughs> um, Jesus Christ describes himself, the Savior describes himself as he, he that's holy. This is an Old Testament uh, phrase. I'm holy, I'm holy, I'm holy, I'm holy. Remember what, what he said to Moses? Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground, separated. Listen, Christian, you are separated for him and for him only. And it's the New Testament name for the Messiah. Old Testament name for God in general, New Testament, the Messiah, he's holy. He's also true. First, first John 5.10, this, uh, this is the faithful and true. Jesus says, I'm truth. His word is to be trusted. I'm going to, oh, everybody got on your steel-toed boots today? Might hurt some feelings. All right? I want you to be very careful when you hear somebody say, I've got a word from the Lord. We have the word of the Lord right here, right? And what parts of this is wrong? None of it. When somebody says, I have a word of the Lord, they're claiming something big. Be cautious. Because honestly, the next thing coming out of their mouth is being equated on the same level as Scripture. I have a word of the Lord, and the bloop, next thing that comes out of the mouth, you better believe it or else. The same thing that you would do with a prophet. Be careful. As a matter of fact, do you... You look at how God is dealing with towards the end of the apostolic era in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts. He's no longer giving new words. 
he's now quoting Scripture. This is important. He used the written words, not a special word from on high. You look at the end of the apostolic area in the book of Acts, nobody else is speaking in tongues anymore. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying we have to look at the Bible and see how it is. Well, Pastor, what are you saying about people that speak in tongues? You ready? You want to write this one down? Okay, ready? All I know is it's not biblical. Am I saying these people are horrible and wicked? Nope. I'm just saying what... Yeah, so other people are like, yes, you... Come on, Pastor, give it to me. No. <laughs> what I am saying is, is what's going on we never see in the book of Acts. We don't see a single example of it in the book of Acts. Every time it happens in the Bible, it's always another human language by someone that doesn't know that language in order to give the gospel every single time. And the only time it even gets kind of mixed up is when we get to 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And one day I'm going to be brave enough to preach that because it's a messed up church. I one time, we, we visited a church in Decatur, Texas called Corinth Baptist Church. And I thought, man, what are we getting ourselves into? But I mean, I'm telling you, it was a cowboy church. Man, the pastor, the pastor had on a belt buckle that was like this big. It was, it was one of those cowboy belt buckles that if you don't sit down right, you're going to cut yourself in half. It was, I mean, it was gorgeous. You know, we, we, we go out to eat afterwards, and he's got like a big piece of chew in his jaw, you know, spitting everything like that. I'm like, all right, <laughs> Corinth Baptist Church it is. <laughs> But um, so it says he's holy. He says he's true. Look what else he says. It's really cool. He says this. He says, um, uh, he that hath the key of David. Now, why is it important for him to mention that he is the one that possesses the key of David? What do you think the key of David is? Kingdom. Everything about the kingdom of David. And by the way, who would be interested in the kingdom of David? Jews, right? These believers have been kicked out of the synagogue. And they're saying, you're not real Jews. And Jesus says, well, actually, I happen to be an authority on the subject. I actually happen to have the key of David. If you look at Isaiah, it's easy to remember. Isaiah 22, 22. If you look at that, that is a prophetic reminder that the Messiah is going to have the key of David. As a matter of fact, it even says with the key of David, the Messiah will open doors that no man can shut and will shut doors that no man can open, which is interesting because that's what this verse says. To possess the key is to have authority. You notice that not everybody around here has keys to our church? If you have keys for this church, you got to have a good reason to have them. When, when, we were at, when we first got to our church over in Manchester, everybody and their uncle and their uncle's dog had a copy of the church keys. Everybody. And so I said, so I said who needs keys? And they told me a list of three people. I went, fine. We're going to change the locks. Well, shouldn't we let everybody know? No. And only these three people are going to get them. Because you need to have an authoritative reason. Hey, do, who do you give keys to your own house to? They better have an authoritative reason to be in your home, right? Amen? You know, I'm, I'm going to give you a secret. We have a little box out there that has the code for the keys. Right? We do. Parents? Only you should know the code. Oh, but pastor, I trust my kids. No, only you should have the code. But pastor, that would require me actually moving 15 feet. Only you should have the code. You need to have the authority because, hey, there's a reason why you're trusted. You're, you're the one that's, that's the member. But a key means 
authority. Now, this is salvation. He has the one. Jesus Christ himself is the one that says what is right and what's wrong. Not some people at a group meeting. And he is the one that's declaring, I'm omnipotent. I'm not me, but Jesus Christ says, I'm omnipotent. I'm all powerful. I am the one that's going to be the final decision on who a proper Jew is and who a proper Jew isn't. He then says in verse 8, he says, I know thy works. Oh no. Oh no. And do you know what he says next about their works? There's nothing negatively said about this church. You think it's because they were a perfect church? No. But I think it's because they were dealing with their sin. When you're in the middle of hard times, your sin becomes very clear. When you're in a battle, Christian, when you're in a battle of truth, you want only truth to have to be discussed. You don't want, well, okay, you say this, but I remember when you stole something. Oh, okay, now I have to combat that and this. These people were in the middle of a doctrinal discussion on, on, on what it means to be a believer. And so they were dealing with their sin as it was going on. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. It says, I know your works. And it's a blessing. I don't want anybody in here. When you hear one day, every believer is going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't want you to be scared. He's good, amen? Do you think he's going to judge you on you? By the way, everyone loses out on that. There's not a single believer that's going to go before Jesus and say, all right, I'm good. You were judged by who he is, but also with not how perfect your works were. Has anybody ever tried to witness to somebody and you just got it wrong? Yeah. Have you ever tried to witness somebody and they just rejected you? Jesus says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Your rewards is not um, production-based. It's faith-based. So many of us, we've messed up in life and, and we, we, we honestly, we truly regret it. But Jesus says, actually, that's under the blood. What have you done? And look towards that. He says, I know your works, and I've set before you an open door. This is another word for eternal security. Christian, this door is open, and guess who can shut it? No one. He says, you've got little power. And I think part of this has to do with this church at Philadelphia was a teeny tiny church. Guess who else is a teeny tiny church? We are. I love that. You know why? Because it, it's, he didn't say you're small, you don't have any power. He says you have a little power. You do have power. Church, we have ways to impact our community for the Lord Jesus Christ. That some of the big men... I'm telling you, it'll blow your mind. I don't know how I got on this YouTube rabbit trail, but it was about Christmas productions. And they had people bungee jumping out of the ceiling of these 8,000-seat auditoriums, right? And they were doing a, a version of The Greatest Showman, and, but they Christianized it. And, and they were doing all these things, and it was all these hoops and, and lights and lasers and everything. And I, and honestly, I was just looking at it, and I didn't go, honestly, my thing wasn't, well, that's not Christianity. I just looked at it and went, how exhausting. <laughs> Why? I'm looking at it, I'm like, 
I would much rather spend a hundred pounds, go to the West End, see a decent show, and come back and have dinner with my wife. I mean, honestly, church is not about entertainment, ladies and gentlemen. It is a training center. It is an encouragement center. And then we go out and we do the work. And I love, he says, you've kept my word. See where he says that? He says, you have little strength and has kept my word. Christian, do you keep his word? Not do you always obey his word, but do you keep it? Homeschool parents, going to let you know, we got into a discussion today in our Bible time. And we talked about when two Christians have a different view on something and both Christians see something uh, as uh, equally important, how do we view it? And one of the things that we discussed is, uh, I, it, in my life, I, I had somebody go, you know, how can you be a pastor? And Because I mentioned Jurassic Park one time in a movie. All right, And thankfully, among movies, that's not the worst movie you could possibly mention, but I mentioned it. And, and somebody who loves me said, I don't understand how a pastor would watch these movies. And you, and you know what I thought in my head? Let me listen to what this man says. Amen? And instead of, honestly, instead of, how do I make, how, how can I justify myself? I desperately wanted it wanted to make sure I was keeping his word. And in the end, I said, I'll be honest with you, right now I'm not seeing it the same way, but please pray for me. Because my goal in life, and Christian, your goal in life isn't, how do I make the Bible fit my life? Right? That's not keeping his word. That's twisting it. That's contorting it. Everybody saw you do sumo squats when you came in. Just letting you know. All right? Your job is, here's God's word, let me keep it. You can struggle with sin, but still keep his word. Let's not move God's word. And we've all met people that have done this, where sin has actually been confronted, and the Bible says something, and they go, forget it, I'll just leave all this instead of change my life. Christian, if you struggle with something, it should, you should constantly go to God, God, I struggle with this, your word says this. Get me to the place that I'm back with that. Amen? This church kept his word and did not deny his name. There was real perseverance there. Verse 9, behold. And this is where Jesus comes to their defense. He says, behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which says they're Jews, but they're not. Do you remember when, when a bunch of uh, Jews came to Jesus? I think they were Pharisees, or they could have been scribes. But they said, uh, at least we know who our dad is. This is a direct attack on the virgin birth. When you read that, know that even in Scripture, his virgin birth was known. It's, it's not a recent thing that the uh, people in the Council of Nicaea under Constantine, you know, developed. This was right in the beginning. And they said, we know who our dad is. Huh. Everybody knows what happened to your mom. Right? And we know that your dad is not your real dad, Joseph. And Jesus says, actually, your father is Satan. <clears throat> Jesus never read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Okay? By the way, if you ever want to get in ministry, look at the times where Jesus had a huge crowd. Everything's going in the right way. And he just blew it up. And I love it. Okay? And Jesus is saying, those people that have kicked you out of the synagogue, that's not my synagogue. Because they're not doing my will. 
They say they're Jews, but they're not. Remember, we, we talked about this a long time ago in Romans. They are Jews outwardly, but not inwardly. Even Israel, not, not everyone that's a Jew is a Jew. Behold, and I love this. He says they call themselves Jews, but they're lying. They're not Jews. They don't belong to me. They belong to the wicked one. Ladies and gentlemen, you can have religious people that look at you, point fingers at you, and they will tell you, you're doing everything wrong. You make sure you're right with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, don't worry about them. Worry about me. I talk to kids all the time. And sometimes they get worried, you know, when we have a quiz. Oh, pastor, you know, you said I needed paper. I don't have paper. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but you, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And they become a big stress ball. And I, I try to look at, listen, I'm the one that makes the rules. If I say don't worry about it, guess what? Don't worry about it. Jesus Christ says he's the one that makes the rules. He's the one that has the key of David. He's the one that decides these things anyways. And he says they've kicked you out for not being Jews. But even the Roman government now says you're not a real Jew. And he says, I know. Not only that, but behold, I'm going to make them to come. Look what it says in verse 9. And worship before your feet. And to know that I, Jesus Christ, have loved you. Boy, number one, isn't that going to be great? One day, no matter how many terrible accusations you get, one day they're going to know not only do you love Jesus, but that Jesus loves you. It's one thing to say, oh, I love God. But it's another thing to say, God loves you. And Jesus says, don't lose heart because they're going to see it one day. And I'm going to forcefully bring it to pass. Now, do you see that phrase that where it says, I'm going to make them come and worship at your feet? Does anybody find that a little awkward? Yeah, why? Why, Sally Ann? Who should we be worshiping? Now, he says, but I'm going to make you worship at their feet. They're going to worship at your feet. Okay, so I'll be honest with you. I'm studying the Bible. I'm like, God, you're absolutely right, but I don't think I get this correctly. So I looked at it. There's actually a couple of different words that are used in our King James Version for worship. What this simply means is he's going to make them uh, bow down and kiss the ground at our feet. He, i.e., he's going to absolutely humble themselves. You don't need to fight anymore. And you fight in this world, guess what? You're going to lose anyways. You don't need to fight. I'm not saying, um, you know, be wishy-washy, become an evangelifish. What I'm saying is, is that you don't have to keep on fighting and making sure you're on top. It'll never happen, not in this world. And Jesus recognized that, and he says, I've got it. Your enemies are going to go prostrate before you like a defeated army. Verse, verses 10 and 11. Because thou hast kept my, the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon, what's that next word? All the world. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the book of Revelation going to talk about in a few chapters? Tribulation. Huh. It's going to talk about the hour of temptation that's going to come to the whole world. And you know what he tells this church right before he starts talking about it? By the way, church, you're not going to be there. Christian, I, I, I know when you know, somebody gets all excited about something bad that happens in this world and they point to, see, in Revelation 12.6, I don't know what Revelation 12.6 says. If, see, in Revelation 12.6, it's happening right now. No, it's not. Christian, you won't be around when tribulation happens. We won't be here. We're not the objects of his wrath. You're checking out what 12.6 says, aren't you? 
We're, we're not going to be here. He's going to take us. We're going to escape the tribulation via the rapture. Now it says, it talks about an hour. The word hour here just simply means a fixed time period. What does it say? Tell me later. Yeah, go ahead. Just say it. Okay, so obviously that's not going on right now. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay. Uh, um, but the tribulation is for unbelievers and only for unbelievers. Let me just help you out here. Revelation 6, 10. Revelation 6, 10. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood upon them that dwell on the earth? Hey, guess what? If God's avenging the earth, it's not believers, amen? It's not those believers on the earth. Look at Revelation 8, 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. You know where these saints are praying? At the throne. These saints, the believers, are praying at the throne. They're not praying at earth. They're praying at the throne. Look at Revelation chapter 11. 11 verse 8. Revelation 11 verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall she see the dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. By the way, one day they're not going to celebrate Christmas anymore. Um, you know how we, we exchange gifts? One day they're going to celebrate de two dead prophet day. And they're going, to, they're going to pass gifts. It's going to be bigger than Christmas. Okay? And by the way, there won't be anything back. What I'm saying is these things occur because the Christians are gone. The Spirit's gone. The world, the earth is wicked. And he says, he says you're not going to be there for that. And there's a reward. It says, it says behold, look at, look at the end of verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Now, why is he mentioning that? He's telling you, be ready. Hold thou fast which thou hast, that no man can take thy crown. There's actually a special uh, gift, a special crown promised in the Bible for those that are looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that are ready. Are you ready? Man, I don't know about you guys, but when we go on holiday or plane trip, Man, that lady over there, she's not sleeping that night because she's got 15 projects that she's promised for other people that she's trying to get ready. If you know my wife, you know I'm telling the truth. And, you know, I, I, I wake up at like 6 a.m. in the morning and I'm like, oh, you're dressed already? She's like, I haven't gone to bed yet. All right, oh, bless you. I'm not lying, am I, dear? No, no. We need to be ready for the, for the rapture a little bit better than that. You need to be ready right at a moment's notice. I know how some of you big families are. Everybody knows you leave for church at mm, that time. What time? 10 a.m. Since they've been alive, 10 a.m. All right, guys, it's 10 a.m. Let's go. What? I haven't, I haven't done this. They're shocked. Am I right or wrong, brother? All of you were like that. Shocked. Absolutely shocked. And listen, that hour is not a secret. And it's not that it comes quickly. It's right on time. And we're not ready. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to be ready for the Lord's return a little bit better than that too. Amen? Now, 
how are we ready? Short sin account, where we're just constantly making sure we're right with the Lord. That's one way to be ready. How terrible would it be for the rapture to happen in the middle of you sinning? You know, you're breaking into a bank. Give me all your... Hi, Jesus. I... Whew, what happened? Right? We need to be ready for that. We need to make sure that those people that need to hear the gospel, hear it. There are so, and look, I know this. We are looking for the Lord's return to some of us, but Lord, don't come back yet. I've got lost friends, lost relatives. When we surrendered to come to England, it was a weird thing because I know how many people are dying without the Lord in England. And I knew when I got here, I can stand in the gap. I could at least give warnings. And it was, it was a weird prayer, Lord, I, I, know, I know you need to come soon, but Lord, can you wait till I get there so other people have a chance? The way you're prepared for the Lord to come is make sure that, that your list of people that you're witnessing to, look, you can't guarantee that they're going to be saved, but you can't guarantee that you've given it. I can give people opportunities. It's up to them to decide it. Are you ready to meet your Lord? Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make in a, a pillar in the temple of my God. Let me ask you a question. How important is a pillar? How long do pillars, how long are pillars designed to last? And we got we got two. <laughs> We really want those to last. Anybody willing to just remove those two pillars and see what happens? Yeah, kids are like, yeah, yeah, sure. Every adult that has to like whip out money to fix everything is like, no, you psycho. And you go to these big temples where they have pillars. Man, those pillars are designed to keep it standing. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus says, you're going to be a pillar in his temple. How permanent is a, t is a pillar? Pastor, when I get to heaven, will I sin and do wrong? Will this whole thing kick off again? No. You're a pillar. Now, that's figurative, amen? You're not immediately going to become stone and hold it up. Look what it says. Him that overcometh, which is every believer, 1 John 5, right? Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. Hey, you're, ne you're never going to get kicked out. Remember what these Jewish believers were faced with? Get out. Get out of the temple. He says, that's never going to happen in my temple. That synagogue made by human hands, that may happen. It won't happen in God's. And then he says, I will write my name, excuse me, I will write unto him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Oh, see, Christians are going to get tattooed. Okay. One of the, this is one of the verses that Christians will use to say, yes, you can have tattoos. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is not a pro-tattoo or an anti-tattoo sermon. I'm just saying that if you want to get Bible evidence of why you could have a tattoo, this ain't it. Okay? Because just like you're not actually going to be a physical temple, you're not going to be physically be a pillar, I'm going to keep this up forever. In the same way, our Heavenly Father is not going to have a tattoo gun. Jesus lives in New Jerusalem. He's not going to do that. What does it mean that a new name is going to be written permanent? You are His. And He's going to make it in a way that you, praise the Lord, will never be able to escape. By the way, later on, Christian, I want you to pay attention to this. Once we finally get to like chapter 20, 21, 
This would be like the fourth year in the new millennium. Okay, once we get there, I'm going to talk about the city of New Jerusalem coming down to he- out of heaven, which is the bride. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that's where we, as the bride of Christ, is going to reside. I think this is what he's gone to prepare a place for us. This is the new Jerusalem. It's going to be there forever. I'm excited about it. This is the promise. That where he's gone to prepare a place, we're going to live there, and our address is going to be permanent. Amen? And you guys better figure out how to love me and like me, because I'm praying that if you don't like me, God will make you move in right next to me. (laughs) For all of eternity, you get to deal with all of this. Amen? This is all about the promise of eternal life. Let's let's go back to these believers. How do you think these believers felt when their own people despised them? How do you think they felt? This is where you respond, or we stay here for another half hour. How do you think they felt? Yeah. Rightfully so, right? I mean, throughout history, the most hated people in history have been the Jews. And when one of your fellow Jews that has been one of the most hated people by the world says, I don't like you either. It says something. And then, and then the world doesn't want them either. And all they have is fellow believers who are suffering the same thing. And sometimes this world is going to make you feel like it's not worth it. And Jesus is just reminding us here, he honestly keeps the score. And it's not pie in the sky one day. He's saying, I see the lies that are said about you. I'll fix them. I see how people are treating you. I'm going to make it right. And there's no doubting about that. And he just says, stay true to my name. Keep my name. Father, thank you for what you've told us in your word about this city of brotherly love. 